Many a dream has died Like a tree planted by the water We never will run dry So living water flowing through God, we thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls With one desire 
Just to know you and to make you known We lift your name on high Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide We know we were made for so much more Father's heart Into the world we're reaching out To show them who you are So living water flowing through God we thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls With one desire Just to Church, Heritage Campus, and to everyone else that's joining us online, thank you for choosing to worship with us today. We are excited to sing God's praises, and we uh, want you to just join in, sing with us, and let's worship our Lord as we sing Standing on the Promises. Help us sing now. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal age. Just let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing on the promises Standing on the promises of God my Savior I cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Sing it out
are these poached eggs? Mm hmm Wow. Mm. Mm. Wait to see what you guys do next week. For Mother's Day? Welcome to Ozark Family Church. That was a great video we just saw, and in case you had forgotten, it is next Sunday that Mother's Day is, so keep that in mind and uh, get your cards ready and hold them until that particular time. And wasn't it great to see our graduating seniors in that video at the beginning of the service? Uh, these are unusual times. We want to honor our graduating seniors, and this would be the typical time that we do it in the uh, school year. Uh, and we may do more once we're able to meet again together and, and uh, give them a more proper honor. But uh, at least we wanted to do something and let them know they're certainly not forgotten and we wish them God's best and pray for their future, certainly. We uh, just received some word that uh, we may be able to start uh, meeting again as a church uh, with certain restrictions uh, that we're not going to like, but nonetheless, it's a start and that's what we're uh, going to do. And I have some uh, notes that I have, so if you see paper flashing in front of you as I uh, share with you today, that's what it's all about. Uh, when uh, President Trump and Missouri uh, Governor Parson asked that there be no large group gatherings uh, so that the nation could flatten that curve, we immediately decided to do services online only. And we did this out of respect for them, but mostly out of respect for God and for your safety as well. The church staff has just received some glimpses at the guidelines for uh, being able to reopen church services. It looks like it'll be a gradual startup and uh, nothing will be as it used to be, at least not right away. Uh, but nothing is set in stone yet, so we're just uh, talking about possibilities today, all right? Uh, let me pass on some things to you that uh, just in case they do happen, it won't take you by surprise. Uh, people have different opinions regarding the uh, seriousness of this pandemic. And all I can say is that you are welcome uh, to your opinion, and I'm not here to change your mind on any, one way or the other on any of it. Uh, what I am here to say is that uh, whenever we are given the green light as church leaders caring for the flock, we have no other option but to take the safest possible course for our congregation. It would be a terrible thing if through our negligence we put people at risk for being infected with the coronavirus. If we err in any of this, and it's possible we could, uh, we want to err on the side of caution instead of the side of danger. We want to exercise the utmost care in our plan of action, and our plan of action will be taken largely from the city and uh, county and state guidelines, and I think you can understand that. Here's what it looks like so far from the information we've uh, received. Uh, some of the limitations on public gatherings have been lifted and uh, we're just waiting for the proper time when we can uh, announce to you that uh, the church doors again will be open to receive you. Uh, it appears now that our church service attendance could be limited as to the number of people we would have attending at any one time. Uh, in saying that, families may sit together, but we'll have to still observe social distancing, that six-foot six rule from other families or other individuals who are sitting in the congregation. So that will kind of limit our usual seating uh, situations. Uh, we're told that uh, drinking fountains should be considered off-limits. Uh, it it uh, was originally that restrooms would be considered off limits, but I think that's been relaxed now, and uh, many of you are breathing a sigh of relief with that. 
Uh, Sunday school and Wednesday night classes will probably be the last ministries to start up, so don't look for that right away. Uh, since there will be no child care, not initially, or children or youth classes, children and youth will have to stay with their parents during a service if you decide to come to a church service. If a parent feels that the uh, children could get restless and cause a disturbance during the service, it may be best for the time being uh, to continue worshiping with the stream service on our website. That just would be an act of consideration. Now, uh, if you feel especially at risk, or if you are not feeling well, or if you have a fever, then you are encouraged to worship with the online service and not here in the sanctuary uh, as we used to do. Uh, fellowship in the building after the services that you are used to doing uh, will not be that way uh, at, at the beginning, at least. Um, in fact, once you leave a service, you'll be ushered directly outside and, and so on. It's, it's just that communication, uh, communicable distance that we're trying to stay away from, and we want to observe that for everybody's safety. So uh, none of this is totally firm yet, and our plan of action is not firm, but it seems to be a logical approach. There may be uh, other things that I'll need to share with you as guidelines become more plain, uh, but I thought giving you some insight on what we are facing would uh, be beneficial to you. Pray for us, the church staff, as we, uh, that we always do the right thing and be considerate of our, our uh, constituents here in the church. Again, we don't know exactly when we'll be released for our meetings, uh, but I felt I should share some of these items to make you a little more prepared when it does happen. Our greatest concern is for the safety and well-being of our Ozark Family Church, for our guests that might attend, and for our community. We want to honor and respect our government authorities and the advice of noted medical experts as to when it is safe to return to corporate worship. We also want to be cautious as to when we begin meeting in person so we can avoid any setbacks. I'm very grateful for you and your support uh, of your pastor and staff during these times of decision making. I know what our, uh, our decisions will not please everyone, but uh, that's just the way it is. We, uh, somebody has to call the shots and we're doing the best we can under uh, the advice that we've been given. Uh, I'm also grateful to you for supporting your church with your faithful giving. Uh, last month we, uh, we got very close to our church budget and I'm so grateful for that and grateful that uh, we can breathe a little sigh of relief that in these strenuous times you have maintained your faithfulness in giving and we're just, uh, you're to be congratulated. Thank you so very, very much. Now, we want to uh, continue our worship time this morning. Uh, oh, by the way, Wednesday night, Pastor will be sharing in the service. He'll be speaking, of course, but we'll also be having communion in the Wednesday night service, so you might prepare yourself for that. Uh, it will not be here in the, in the church. I'm, when I speak of service, it'll be on our, our online service, but communion will be shared. He'll be directing us in communion, so you have your a morsel of bread or cracker and your juice there so you can participate when he gives the direction. All right? Well, let's continue worship now with music, and uh, God bless you as you do. Thank you for your attention while I was sharing with you those guidelines and, and trying to make it somewhat plain to you uh, as, as we know them now. God bless you. Greg, lead us on, please. Worship Church. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, no, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. No, I fear. Doesn't stand a 
chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. today. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's sing in church. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And one how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be Sing that verse again. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned. 
about it, church. Let's sing it. He took my sins. He took my sins and my sorrows. And he made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered. people said amen praise his name pray with me dear heavenly father god i thank you so much that we are able to stand in your love and be called your children god thank you so much for this time spent together and for everyone watching um, i pray that you would just touch their hearts and holy spirit that you would just be in their homes and that they would feel your presence god and thank you for the families that are being um, coming closer together. And God, I pray that you would just bless us and keep us safe and help us during this time. It is in your name I pray and ask it all. Amen.
sing it with us, church. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to be a child of God? Thank you for that music today. And I hope that you're here with us this morning and you're looking forward to worshiping God. We're just thanking Him every day for His blessings and how He is so good to us. And today, I want to speak to you about God's way is always the right way from 2 Kings chapter 5. So if you want to turn your Bible there this morning, you can do that. And we're going to look at how God works in our lives in strange and mysterious ways. And in the end, if we obey Him, He will bless us. And I know that you want to be blessed today. So let's just dig right into the God's Word today and see what He has to say for us. In 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 10, it says this, And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come again to you, and you shall be clean. Of course, Elijah, the prophet of God, was speaking to Naaman, who was a commander for the king of Syria. And the commander, Naaman, had a dreaded disease called leprosy. Now, leprosy is a picture in the Bible of sin. And this story has several hidden truths. But one of the truths that we find in God's Word is that that leprosy is like sin in our lives. And when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and realize we're a sinner that we're lost, that we have a dreaded disease that is eating our spirit and our soul and will send us to a devil's hell, that we can come to Jesus and we can call upon His name and repent of our sins and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you're not a Christian today, you listen very carefully because God will speak to your heart and at the end of the service, we'll have a time of prayer and you can pray with us and accept Jesus into your life and begin this new life of being born again. Well, in this story, this man Naaman was a very respected man. He was a courageous man, a commander of the, of the Syrian army and people looked up to him, but yet He had leprosy. You know, when I think about this story, I think about the fact that no one is immune from problems. This man had a serious problem that would eventually take his life if he wasn't cured. And we're going to see that he was cured from that leprosy. But everybody has problems. When you think about it, it doesn't matter if you're a commander of a great army. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO of a corporation or if you're a a lowly servant in some business everybody 
has problems. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, black or white. Doesn't matter whether you're married or not married, single or divorced. Doesn't make any difference who you might be in this life. Everybody has problems. But God's Word teaches us in this passage some lessons that we can learn. And here's one of the first lessons that no one is immune from problems. And so don't think that in your life that you're going to be immune from problems because people have problems. Look first to the Lord when you have problems. Sometimes we'll run to everybody and every source we can before we stop and think, why don't I pray about it? Why don't I go to the Lord about this problem in my life? So do that. And then set a goal and then begin to have a plan and let God become first in your life to help you with your problem. And if you'll do that, he'll help you. This is what Naaman needed to learn and, and God was going to teach him. The second thing I say here is, is that the Bible says that uh, in verse 1 that Naaman, the captain of the army of uh, king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable. He was honorable, but he still had a problem. And because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria, he was also a mighty man in valor, courage, but he was a leper. You see, this man was a strong man. This man had fought many battles, and Israel and Judah were following away from God, just like America is doing right now and needs to desperately turn back to God. This man had a problem and he needed help. And we as Americans need to realize that we're in serious trouble and we need to turn back to the Lord, especially in these times in which we're living right now. And the Bible tells us man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. I read about a young man who just got married and he was preaching and one day he misquoted this scripture and he said, man that is married to a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Well, he was in trouble with his wife that night because of what he had quoted in the service that evening. And so you've got to be careful to realize you can't get down and feel down and out and discouraged because you have problems because, hey, listen, everybody has problems. But the Lord wants to help you and he wants to teach you through these problems, uh, the right way to look to Him for the solution. Well, the second thing I see is that God will use the most unlikely sources to help us. Well, this man had a problem, and he was trying to figure out what to do. And in the story here, we see that in verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, a, a, a servant girl from Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. She was a servant to Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would cure him of his leprosy. The little maid said, I know a man of God. He's in Syria. He's a prophet. He's a great man of God. And if if Naaman could just go to him, he could find healing in his life. And one went and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the man that is of the land of Israel. In 1 uh, Corinthians 1 and 18, the Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but in us which are saved, it is the very power of God. God would use this little maid to speak to that great commander. And God wants to speak to you, and He'll use some of the most unlikely sources to help us. He even uses the foolishness of preaching to save those through the power of God. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 27, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Then he tells us why. He says, and base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and things which are not 
to bring to nothing things that are. Yes, God could use a little maid to speak to that great commander. God can use whatever he chooses to speak to your heart today that you might better know the Lord and do what is right. He says the reason he does this, he uses uh, things that are just seem so simple and so, so uh, basic in life that the world would laugh at and say, well, that's foolish to, to, for someone to use somebody like that. He said that no flesh, no person should glory in his presence. That, that, that God would get the glory for everything that's done. And so God wants us to help, help us. He can use a mighty king like David, but he can also use a humble shepherd like David. You know, he can use a great, a great mighty apostle Paul who started many of our churches. But he can also use a little lad with five loaves and two fishes. So you be encouraged that God can even use you to do great and mighty things in the work of God. And then I think about the fact that the answer to our problems won't usually be what we want to hear. I remember a time when um, my wife and I, we just got married and we were... Uh, Build, we had bought a home, a little cottage, and we were building a fireplace there out of stone. And so we found out where there's where some stone at, and we went to the field there, and the, the person said we could have all that we wanted. And we started picking up those stones, and I remember my wife saying to me, she said, well, you better be careful. You know, you never know what might be under one of those stones. And I said, ah, you know, I'll be all right. You know, I was trying to be the tough husband, just newly married and everything. So, you see, sometimes we, 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 we don't want to hear what somebody else has to say. But she kept saying, now, you need to be careful. And all of a sudden, I picked up one of those stones, and underneath of it was a, a yellow jacket nest. Now, for you that have never lived on a farm, that's a, that's a bee that when it stings you, it feels like somebody throwed a rock at you and hit you. Well, all of a sudden, and these, these, these yellow jackets, they can get very vicious, and they can get very mad. And so all of a sudden, I knew what had happened. And boy, one or two of them had already stung me. And I took off up the hill toward the old pickup truck. And all the way I was running up, you know what my wife was doing? She was laughing at me. They were chasing me, and they were chasing me. And I was thinking to myself, you should have listened to your wife. But I kept on running, and I finally jumped in the pickup truck. And two or three of them got in there and stung me. And when it was all over, I had seven of them sting me and Brenda I told her I said I'm really hurting I'm really hurting these things really are painful and she laughed and she said well I don't feel anything oh she had so much compassion on me she said you know I told you and I warned you and you didn't want to hear it well in this story Naaman didn't want to hear what he was told and uh, in verse 5 and the king of Syria said go now and I'll send a letter uh, unto the kings of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten charges of raiment. Someone said it was about $75,000 worth. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, Now when this letter is coming to you, behold, I have with it sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Because the king had heard that <clears throat> there was someone there in Israel that could help Naaman. And it it, it got to the point where the, the king of Israel was uh, very afraid. And he came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he tore his clothes. And, and, uh, and he said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send unto me to cure a man of his leprosy? He said, he's, he's, he's just wanting to start a quarrel with me. They're wanting to fight us. And I don't want to be in a fight. And he, he got really scared about what was going on here because the king of Syria had sent that letter. But he wanted his commander healed of leprosy. And verse 8 says, It was so when Elijah, the man of God in Israel, had heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. That was a symbol of, of humility and a symbol of uh, being afraid and humbling himself. That he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let this man come now to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot you know I, I just want to stop there just a minute and say you know what our our nation needs 
You know what our churches need? You know what our communities need? You know what our families need to know that somewhere there's a man of God who can get a hold of the Lord and pray and see wonderful miracles happen. Why don't you take on that challenge as a man to be that kind of man, the man of God? There is a prophet in Israel that can do mighty works of God. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And I think he was expecting Elijah to come out and say some magical prayer and put his hands on him and heal him. Well, he was a, he was a leper, and so Elijah wasn't going to come close to him. And Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come again to you, and you shall be clean. You'll, you'll have a healthy body again if you'll just do what I tell you to do just be obedient and that's what he he said to do you just do what I've told you to do now that didn't settle good with Naaman the Bible says in Psalm 119 164 you may not have known this was in there but it says seven times a day do I praise you because of your righteous judgment the psalmist said seven times is a number of completeness and perfection and and the psalmist says, seven times in a day, I just praise you. I just worship you and I love you because of your righteous judgments. And so here we see that uh, Elijah is telling Naaman to go dip in the uh, Jordan River seven times. I like to think about seven ducks in the water. But here we see this person getting upset about it. You know, the answer to our problems won't usually be what we want to hear. I heard about a newly married couple, a husband and wife, they were remodeling their kitchen. And uh, they began to argue, and the wife says, well, this is the way I want to do it. And the husband said, no, this is the way I want to do it. And I'm going to do it this way because I'm smarter than you. Well, that was the wrong thing to say. And that night, he spent the, the night sleeping on the couch. So you, you've got to be careful that you... Uh, hear what God is telling you and you do what God is telling you to do and then I think that the next thing that God wanted to teach Naaman was we'll be tempted to come up with our own plan our own idea and the Bible says in verse 11 but Naaman was angry he didn't he didn't like the idea of going and dipping in the Jordan River I've been there and I've been to the Jordan River and I, I want to tell you it's not it's not a clear clean uh, stream of water it is is mostly muddy and it's not really very uh, pleasant to look at it's a, it's a muddy water basically as it runs from the mountains all the way down through and uh, he was angry and went away and said behold I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord is God and strike his hand over the place where I had leprosy and cure me are not Abana and far, far rivers of Damascus and Syria that, that flow with beautiful spring water? Aren't they better than the waters of Israel and the river Jordan? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He was upset and he was mad because he wanted to hear something different. You know, many times we try to plan out what we want to do in life and we get ourselves in trouble. The Bible says in Proverbs 14 and 12, There is a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And then I think of the scripture in Proverbs 21 and 2. It says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. The Lord is the one who speaks to us. And so this is why the next point that Naaman need to learn, that maybe you need to learn in your life today, is wise friends will always encourage us to do what God says. Now think about that. Wise friends. I think about the fact that true friends will tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. That's so important that you realize that. Listen to the Lord when He speaks to you. Naaman's friends encouraged him to do the right thing. And of course, we know that he did. In verse 13, and his servants came near and spoke unto him to Naaman and said, My father, if the prophet had bid you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather then would he say, if he says to you, wash and be clean? Shouldn't you do that? 
I think of that good old song, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I hope that you'll do that in your life just like Naaman. And then God's way is always the right way. Amen? God's way is always the right way. You know, I think that some people want to do the easy way or the lazy way or maybe the inexpensive way or the, in, the convenient way. But God will never lead you except to do what is right. He'll never lead you to do the wrong thing. So we need to obey God's principles. And when we do obey God's principles and apply them to our lives, we'll get God's results. And that will be a blessing. God doesn't call us to necessarily the, the easy way, but the right way. And so when you think about this in verse 14, then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored again like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Oh, the Lord wants to clean you of your sin. Christian, you know, it's wonderful to be a child of God. But sometimes we get sidetracked. Sometimes we get in sin and we backslide. And we just need to be cleansed by the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, that He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, stay clean in the Lord. Stay, stay faithful to the Lord and obey the Lord. And God's going to bless you because of that as long as you always realize God's way is always the right way. Now, there are some things that Satan will use to try to hinder you. I think about discouragement. You know, nobody else is facing this problem like me, preacher. No, no, everybody faces problems. So you need to just, as I hear people say sometimes, when I get a little bit down, my wife compassionately will come to me and she'll say, suck it up, buttercup. You know, you just got to go on. And then Satan will use sometimes distractions. He'll try to distract us and he'll try to get us to rationalize that it's okay to do this or that when we know God says don't do that. And then I think he'll use detractors. And when I think about that, I, I think the fact that sometimes if you're trying to live for God and do what's right like Naaman was doing, that there'll be people make fun of you for being a Christian. And there'll be things that'll try to distract you and get first place in your life and you don't even realize it. It may be your family, it may be your finances, your job, it may be uh, sports, it may be some other uh, thing that you're doing, some, some uh, thing that you, you know that it's okay, but you're not putting God first in your life. And then I think that he also uses deception and blinds us to the truth. You see, you're never going to obey God and regret it. And that's the last thing that Naaman would learn, that I want you to learn. You'll never going to obey God and regret it. You know, I've never heard a person that loves the Lord and walked with Christ all their life at the end of their life say, you know, preacher, I just, I just wish I hadn't become a Christian. I just wished I hadn't wasted all my life serving the Lord. You know what? They don't say that. A Christian loves the Lord at the end of their life. And sometimes even on their deathbed with tears in their eyes, they'll say, I am so glad I know Jesus. I'm so glad I know for sure that if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I know that, that when I die, I'm going to see my Jesus. And I don't have any regrets for serving the Lord. I have a re lot of regrets of decisions I've made in life. But one of them is not serving Jesus. And don't you regret serving the Lord. You get in there and serve God and be faithful. In me. It'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. And I'll tell you all these years that I've served the Lord, I don't regret it one time. I've served Him since I was 17 years old. And I'm thankful and I want to be faithful to the very end. Well, verse 15 says, Naaman returned the man of God and he and all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray you, take a blessing from your servant. Well, he didn't take the blessing. He didn't take the gift. Naaman felt like, you know, God's the one that did it and he needed to receive the glory. But Naaman had become so blessed. So what can we learn from this? 
Well, one thing is obedience to God requires faith on our part. And that is, can I trust God to do what He said He would do in the way He said He would do? That takes faith. It takes obedience. And then I think of another thing that we can learn is that obedience requires our faithfulness. Can God trust me to do my part all the way? Can he trust me? And that's a good question that you can ask yourself today. You see, God's way is always the right way. And maybe today you're saying in your heart, I realize I'm not right with God. I'm not ready to meet the Lord. I'm not ready to face judgment and death. I want to be. Then pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen to me. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord has saved you. You believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the grave on the third day, that he's your Lord and Savior, then you get in touch with us. You call that number that's on the screen. We'll be glad to talk to you and help you in your walk with the Lord. And if you're a Christian today, you know, it's wonderful to be a child of God. And let me just encourage you. God's way is always the right way. And learn, no one is immune from problems. And God will use the most unlikely sources to help us. The answer to our problems won't usually be what we want to hear. We'll be tempted to come up with our own plan. And wise friends will always encourage us to do what God says. God's way is always the right way. You're never going to obey God and regret it. And let me just say to you again, all these years I've served the Lord, I wouldn't trade the whole world and all the money in this world for knowing my Jesus. And I want you to know Him in the wonderful, loving, sweet way that I know Him. And I just thank the Lord for you, and I thank the Lord for His Word, and I thank the Lord for teaching us today that God's way is always the right way. God bless you. Stop.
Yeah.